We'll call the meeting to order at uh, 940. Quorum of the board is present. State Board of Education meeting of January 10th, 2017 is called to order. First item on the agenda is approval of agenda in order of priority. Are there any items to add or delete from the agenda? If not, a motion is in order to approve the agenda. So moved. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries. I'd like to welcome Tom McMillan and Nikki Snyder, who are the newest state board members who were elected to eight-year terms and beginning January 1, 2017. At this point, Marilyn, please introduce the board. Yes. To my immediate left is the state superintendent, who also serves as the chair of the board, Brian Whiston, and then Cassandra Albridge. She's board member from Rochester Hills, Michelle Fecto, board member from Detroit, Richard Ziley, board member from Dearborn, Nikki Snyder, who you just heard the state superintendent welcome, is a board member from, at this point, Pinckney. And then she's seated next to the Teacher of the Year, Tracy Hordisky. She teaches in Kanawha Hills, which is in the Grand Rapids area, when she's not seated at the board table here. And then across the way is Craig Ruff. He's the governor's rep representative. I, I'm not sure if he'll be able to join today. And then Eileen Weiser is doing her Vanna White impression down there. She's from Ann Arbor. She's board member. Tom McMillan, also a newly elected board member. He is from Rochester Hills. Lupe Ramos Montini, board member from Grand Rapids. And Pamela Pugh is a board member from Saginaw, and she is expected to join us um, on the phone. So, and I'm Marilyn Schneider, the state board executive. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, we now introduce new employees, uh, the newest employees, and uh, we begin with Kyle. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Karen Cody. If you could stand up and tell a little about yourself, and you're all here to the party. Welcome. Vanessa, please. Uh, good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Marty Snitchin. I don't think I said your last name right. Yes, Snitchin. Sorry. <laughs> uh, from our Office of Educator Talent. Uh, I'm Marty Snitchin. Uh, I'm the Regional Sports Analyst at the Office of Educator Talent. I mainly work with the um, regional liaisons uh, and take also calls on educator effectiveness ratings. Um, prior to this, I taught 13 years at Morris Area Schools, where I served different roles as President of their Education Association and uh, Writing Curriculum Chairperson. Welcome. And we also have Connor Lachman, who's an intern with our Office of Educational Improvement and Innovation. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm in the Office of Education Improvement and Innovation, day two. Um, <laughs> um, I'm a graduate of Michigan State University, go green. And uh, mm -hmm. this time to look at policy issues from priority schools. I almost had to gavel them, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Do we have anybody else? Any other new employees? Seeing none, we welcome all of our new employees. Let's welcome them to the department. <laughs> if you plan to offer public comment at today's meeting, please complete a form and get it to Maryland as soon as possible. The forms are on the table outside of the boardroom, and board uh, open comments is tentatively scheduled for 1 o'clock today. First order of business is the ceremonial swearing in of our new board members, Tom McMillan and Nikki Snyder. It's the board's custom to have a ceremonial swearing in during the first official meeting of newly elected board meetings. Tom and Nikki were, as we mentioned, elected by the voters at the November 8, 2016 election, and both have officially been sworn in before today so that they could be doing business. So if I could have Tom and Nikki come up front here, and we'll have you swear you in. So if you could uh, raise your right hand, uh, repeat after me. I state your name. I, I Tom Nicky McMillan. Snyder. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. I will, I will support, support the Constitution, Constitution of the United States. States. And the Constitution of this state. And the Constitution of this state. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties. And I will faithfully discharge the duties. Of the Office of State Board of Education. Of the Office of State Board of Education. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my abilities. Congratulations and welcome. Okay. 
Next, we move to the election of State Board of Education Officers. Uh, at this time, we will accept nominations. Um, Pam is trying to find a password. Oh, okay. Today, so. All right. Let's uh, wait one moment. Any color as long as it's black. <laughs> well, we're on commercial break. Okay, Anybody so else need anything? Or parking lot. Let's see. But you know we had commercials? Just kidding. <laughs> There's a lot we need. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That I can provide. Not sure <laughs> yeah. that you can provide it. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yes. Well, there's a metaphor for life there. There we go. Thank you. Certainly. Okay. <laughs> Are we still dialed in? Is it still green? Yeah. 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 Timer's still going. We'll hear a beep once you Everybody around the room. Yeah, we didn't do that, did we? Uh, we skipped the introductions of everybody in the room, so we're going to do that while we're waiting. So if we could have Marty. Great. Hi. I'm Marty Ackley. I'm the Director of Public and Governmental Affairs here in the Department of Education. My name is Mark Hall. I'm with the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. Good morning. Kelsey Martinez from the Michigan Association of Secondary School Principals. David Michelson, Michigan Education <coughs> Association. Terrence Lunger, Superintendent of the Cavalry College uh, Media School District. Gary Jones, intern at the Frederick Group. Justin Clement, Government Affairs Consultant at the Frederick Group. And he's done office of Hispanic Latin American. Um, Jose Mendez, Hispanic Latino Commission. Sonia Hernandez, Commissioner with the Hispanic Latino Commission of Michigan and adjunct professor at GRCC. Thank you. Chris Flavor with Gong War News Service. <laughs> Jacob Kanzler with MERS News. Brian McVicker with MLive.com. Brian Lewis, facilitator with the Michigan Special Education Advisory Committee. Steve Bass with the Michigan Department of Education. Kyle Brown, Deputy Superintendent of Operations and Finance. Vanessa Kinsler, Deputy Superintendent, uh, Educator, Student and School Support Team. Susan Brown, Deputy Superintendent, K through 8, Student Family. <laughs> I wondered what happened to the other 12. <laughs> nice Good morning, Nora Jones, Assistant Principal with the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. Good morning, Jim Sass, Chief Assistant Superintendent. Caroline Leifan, Legislative Liaison. Good morning, Wendy Larvick, Chief of Staff. Okay. So what problem are we having? Well, Pam's walking in, so we're not sure. Is it here? Yep, she's in. So she must be walking into her other commitment. Oh, walking into. Okay. Okay. Call. Transition period. So she'll call when she can. So did you leave her a message? Is that? Yeah, we texted her the conference call number. Um, so she should be calling. Since she's in traffic, okay. and we'll call in a minute. Sure. Stuck in Chicago it's, it's, traffic. It's, it's 
got spots. It's just showing. Mm -hmm. It rings when it should. So I'll show you that. Want to go on with a report and then do elections? Yeah. Unless that's your <coughs> You think it's you? We can go on with the first record. While we're waiting for her to call in, we're going to go on with the first report. So the next item of the committee, the whole agenda is a presentation on top 10 and 10. We continue to work with stakeholders to develop Michigan into a top 10 education state. Within the next 10 years, Chief Deputy Superintendent Norma Jean Sass has been providing monthly presentations on this multifaceted initiative. She's here to share information on the systematic infrastructure, a way of work that we're going to be using in the department. I'm not sure what you said there. <laughs> Could you repeat that? Yeah, that's right. I think I was pretty clear. I don't know. Norma Jean, please. Yes. <coughs> Good morning again. I'm very excited to um, share this with you. It's another piece of infrastructure that we're working on within the department, and um, it really <coughs> is just a system of a way that we can bring our work forward throughout the department. It's really around goal seven of the goals and strategies. And goal seven is to further develop an innovative and cohesive state agents, education agency that supports an aligned, coherent education system at all levels. So we know that we need to really pay attention to those um, pieces of systems thinking, the fiscal, the right. standards, PD and PA, data that. monitoring, and governance and communication are, are huge pieces also of that. Norma Jean, let me, uh, let me okay. interrupt. Pam, is that you on the line? All right, so how long are you on the phone? We can either go to the elections or we can continue with the report. I think if we, can, can we go to the elections? Yep, we'll go to the elections. Okay. All right. We're very flexible. <laughs> All right, so we are going to the elections. Uh, the bylaws require uh, every uh, odd year to be doing the elections, so we're doing it. We'll start with the Office of President. Are there nominations uh, for the Office of President? Tom? Yes, uh, I nominate uh, Cassandra Albridge and Richard Ziley as co-presidents. Is there a second to that motion? Support. Are there any other nominations? I declare nominations for the Office of President to be closed. Nominee uh, right. Cassandra, do you, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I just want to be able to comment before we take the vote. Yes, but. yep. Uh, we will be able to do that. Cassandra, do you accept the nomination? Yes. Dr. Z, Z do you accept the nomination? Yes. Com uh, discussion? I, I will be abstaining from the vote on this. Uh, as all of you know, I have worked behind the scenes extensively to uh, request that we operate as a committee of the whole uh, in an effort to change the dynamics that we've had, uh, which have been 6-2 and uh, one party controlling for 12 years. So uh, I will be abstaining as we move forward on this. I respect the people who are willing to serve, um, but I don't believe it's the right solution. Any other comments? Lupe, please. Yeah, and I will also be abstaining from this um, election, this vote, because I strongly believe that we should at least wait to have the new members acclimated to the structure of the board I feel that, that the new members should uh, get to know who we as board members are, who the superintendent is, who the, board, the uh, Michigan Department of Education, how they operate, how our processes in the different committees uh, function. Uh, they have been sitting as uh, members of this board for approximately, what, 10 minutes? And I think they need at least one working meeting uh, before we have the election of officers. Any other discussion? Seeing none, Mertz, please take a roll call vote for Facto. the Office of President. Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pew? Yes. Ramos Montini? Abstain. Snyder? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Weiser? Abstain. Ziley. Yes. Six two. Six two. Motion carries. 
Cassandra and Dr. Z will be co-presidents. Next up is the Office of Vice President. I understand there may be a motion to amend the bylaws. Don? Uh, yeah, I, I would uh, make a motion just to simply change the shall to a may as far as uh, electing co-vice presidents. I don't, I don't think we need six officers. I think four is probably uh, sufficient or very sufficient. So I would, um, and I know that it has to lay over a month, but uh, in the interim, I hope that we would uh, just wait on that election and, and change the bylaws. Okay, Eileen? And I would uh, propose a second amendment that we insert a suspension clause, which nearly every bylaw that I've ever dealt with has. Um, we couldn't have gone as a committee of the whole without uh, that, that clause. There may be other times when we will want to, as a board, uh, suspend the uh, rules that we have decided we are we governed by. So is there support for the motion, an amended motion? Supported what? by Dr. Z? Is that an amended motion? Yes, yeah, so it sounds like we have two amendments. Okay, two amendments. Okay, was there a support on mine? I'm sorry. I, I uh, think I you have. All right. I would oh. support. I would support. Oh, okay. Terms. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, but I would also add the second amendment, which gives us more flexibility okay. as a board. And it would not have been necessary to have the may and shall change if we simply said that we were suspending the bylaws. So. All right, so we have two different motions that will be laid over to be voted on in February. One is changing shall to may, and another. A second one is to allow for suspension. Dr. Z, you seconded both of those? Yes. Okay. Uh, so those will be held over for uh, till next board meeting. So I would like a motion to table the Office of Vice President for at this point. So that motion. Support, moved by Cassandra, supported by Tom. Any discussion on the tabling? No discussion on tabling, actually. All those in favor of tabling, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. All right, so that was an aye in favor, right, Pam? Yes, yes. There was. all right. <laughs> Move to the office of secretary. Are there any nominations for secretary? Dr. Z, please. I nominate uh, Michelle Fecto. Okay, is there support for Michelle Fecto? Support. It's been moved and supported. Are there any other nominations? Nominations are now closed for the office of secretary. Any discussion? Seeing none, Mertz, please take a roll call vote. Fecto? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pew? Yes. Ramos Montini. Abstain. Snyder. Yes. Albrich. Yes. Weiser. Abstain. Siley. Yes. 6 2. Motion carries 6 2. Michelle Fecta is secretary. Next office is treasurer. Are there any nominations for treasurer? Cassandra, please. I'd like to nominate Tom McMillan for treasurer. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Dr. Z. Tom, you accept the nomination? Yes. I forgot to do that with Michelle, but you accepted it. <laughs> uh, Tom accepts the nomination. Are there any other nominations? Nominations are now closed for the Office of Treasurer. Merch, please call the roll. Fecto? Yes. <laughs> McMillan? Yes. Pew? Yes. Ramos Montini? Abstain. Snyder? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Weiser? Abstain. Siley? Yes. 6-2. Motion carries 6-2. Tom is the treasurer. Delegate of the National Association of School Boards, are there a nomination? I believe Pam would like to make a nomination. I, yes. Pam? I, I would like to nominate Nicolette uh, Snyder. All right. Nikki Snyder has been nominated. Is that seconded? Support. It's been supported. Nikki, do you accept the nomination? Thank you. Are there any other nominations? I declare nominations closed for delegate to the National Association of State Boards of Education. Merch, please call the roll. Fecto? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pew? Yes. Ramos Montini? Abstain. Snyder? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Weiser? Abstain. Siley? Yes. 6 2. Motion carries 6 2. Nikki Snyder is the delegate to the National Association of School Boards of Education. Now we move back to the report on top 10 and 10. Sorry for the interruption there, please. Hi, Pam. Thank you. Pam. I apologize. <coughs> I'm going to jump off and later. Thank you. <coughs> so picking up um, where we left off, it's a systemic way of work, and it's around goal seven, which is being more effective and efficient through all the levels of organizations for the benefit of learners. So 
Um, we know that we have the transformation zone as one of the ways that we're bringing work forward with um, the 10 and 10 plan. This is um, just another way that we will be bringing work forward. There are many ways that we're bringing work forward, but these two specifically are um, making it happen um, and helping it to happen with many of the initiatives. So in this um, approach, we're really building, again, a system across MDE so that it can enhance our cross-office work that we do and address um, some of the barriers that we have felt in the past. We believe it builds capacity. It helps to ensure consistency and coherence across initiatives and across programs so that um, we're very aware within the department um, who is doing what initiatives and that we can make that aware also, um, make external partners aware of that. There are um, sort of, if you could just go back to that, we, um, unfortunately we've started calling these buckets of work and you know how language sometimes sticks and so we end up with these, um, if you will, buckets of work until we come up with a better area. But you see that we have defined effort, data and evaluation, communication, professional learning and technical assistance, as well as resources um, and funding, uh, personnel and funding, and accountability of, of effort. So those are really um, buckets of work that we feel need to be considerations of what we do at MDE and anything that we're bringing forward. State design team and the um, exec war team, which is cabinet and the deputies, um, help with the visioning and how we're bringing this through. So let's pull these apart a little bit and talk about each of the areas. The first one being defined effort. Defined effort is a very key part of this because we want to be sure that what we are bringing forward, that we have defined it clearly, that we know um, what the components are of that effort. We know what it is, what it isn't. And then we look at are there other pieces that we um, need to be sure that we examine, such as what is the research out there about it, um, a scope and document review. Uh, we may develop practice profiles depending upon what the initiative is and, and basically gathering background information around this. Resources um, is a key part as we look at what are, uh, what is the work that's going through. We know that we need to consider that initially to talk about what funding and what personnel do we have to, to bring this forward. What are federal and state resources? So all of this is intertwined and that's kind of an early effort that we know we need to determine the resources as we begin the process and it goes into that uh, defining our effort. So those two go together with um, the deputies and uh, the design team at that level looking at just what are the resources available um, that are needed to bring this effort forward. It doesn't mean that that's only where it happens. It's going to happen throughout the system because we need to keep an eye on do we have the resources, the supports to bring forward. Communication is another early effort that um, we know that we need to look at the messages. And initially, this will be what's the communication within the department with the things that we are bringing forward. And I'm going to talk to you more about communication because that's such a key piece of infrastructure as we go. Data and evaluation are, uh, is the next bucket, if you will. We want to be a data-driven organization, and so we need to look at what, how are we going to measure this, what are we going to use to measure if we're really having the desired effect that we want to have from the work that we're bringing forward. So we feel this is really um, an important piece. Also, it's not just um, the benchmarks and indicators. We also want to be sure that we measure um, the practice and the delivery of the practice as we go forward so that we can look at where, where might we be falling down if we need to, to do that. Professional learning and tactical assistance, again, are uh, key pieces of the infrastructure as we look at the system. We want to use the standards of professional learning as we bring things through. Uh, so we need to know what are the supports that are needed for the people or the institutions that are also bringing this forward. What tools? can we um, support 
use as support? What might some of the barriers be that we need to identify and then address? And then how does it intersect with other professional learning supports that might be taking place in the field? So just to go back to communication briefly, again, this is about what are the messages that we need to send and who do we need to send them to. So we know that we definitely need to be aware of what information is needed internally and what do we need to also convey externally about all of the things that we're bringing forward. We need to have perspectives identified so that we're sure that they're represented in our process. So this is the plan, again, back as the whole, that all of those buckets, if you will, um, are really intertwined and work together, but we also want to make sure that we are no noticing and naming them. So as we go through, that we address each of these areas as a package of consideration for what we're bringing forward. So who are the people in this plan? So um, we have the deputies that will be um, kind of assigned, if you will, that will be point people in each of these areas um, to make sure that we're going forward. We also have the design team because that's the team that is really in the process of learning about implementation science and, uh, and their, their visioning and their working together to bring things forward. <coughs> we have, will have content experts from MDE and then we also wish to have external stakeholders in each of those areas. So we have quite people and we have the um, people that will help to bring forward the work. We will determine who is in each of the areas by again looking at what competencies do we need for that area and what perspectives do we need so that we can then also have a pool of people that we have um, kind of a database for, make sure that we're not always going to the same people, but we have good representation of people with strong competencies to help us bring work forward. So why? Why do this process um, throughout MDE as our, as our way of work? One of the things we believe that it will ensure communication, again, both externally and internally as we go forward, which will help with our transparency um, as well in and out. We will need coherence, um, alignment of our efforts in MDE so that we're very aware of, of where we're going and, and what's being done. It will help us to eliminate what we call our silos so that we have more of that cross office work that happens in a natural way by the way that we've been pulled together around an effort. Um, again, as an organization, we wish to be a, a data-based organization so that we're looking at the data along the way to make sure that is it working or isn't it? What parts of it are working, what, what isn't? So again, to make that just a part of the system and a part of the way that we do work. We will be building capacity as we work through this system. Um, whoops, I, I got ahead of Steve here, my, my Vanna. Um, I, transparency I already spoke to with our communication and um, with our coherence, we hope to just have that help us in that realm. And the consistency so that we know how we're doing things across the entire department. And then uh, all of this will help us to build capacity both within and without uh, outside of the department as we do the work and uh, have more learnings around what it is that we're doing. So we've looked at what are some from the 10 and 10, some deep drivers that we feel will bring the strategic plan forward. So what we have is a, a timeline of uh, 10 to 11 pieces that we wish to start on using this process. The goal that is, is that eventually down the um, the road a ways that we would um, have this just as our way of work that we do everything but we know that we need to start with some pieces so that we can learn along the way so a comprehensive needs assessment is a need that is going to affect many other aspects <coughs> as we're bringing forward 10 and, forward 10 and 10 and ESSA we know that we need to define clearly evidence-based practices and that will help us as we bring forward family engagement and partnership districts so this shows that we're starting in January with these pieces and then in February, March, we will be addressing the family engagement and the partnership districts because we need to have that other work done um, before to be able to address that uh, in a way that will be most beneficial. 
The biliteracy seal is in a different color. This is something that came out of the 10 and 10 that we thought we could um, start working on right away and it's more of a defined timeline. So we have met with some groups and we're starting now. We hope to by May have direction around this and we're using this process to bring that forward um, so that that can be possible for our districts around the state. And then we have the MTSS, as you know, that we've brought as um, the, the uh, transformation zone. And Remember so we have new board members, so you can't use these uh, acronyms. Oh. <laughs> You're right. So we have um, the transformation zone and MTSS is what we'll be bringing forward with that and I'm going to show that graphic in just a minute. And then the feedback differentiated supports deeper learning, personalized learning and aligned curriculum are all pieces of our learner centered supports in our focus areas. And those we look at as tier one, the, those um, that menu, if you will, of really evidence-based practices that we feel can be deep drivers in, in bringing us forward to be a top 10 um, state within 10 years. So we want to um, start defining those right away as for our partnership districts and for the other work that we're doing. Richard, um, did you? Yes, I just, what is the biliteracy? Okay, the biliteracy seal, and I hope when we get further down the line, we would like to bring it to you. It is looking at um, students that on their diploma, they could have a seal if they speak two or more languages fluently. Somebody like me. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, it's Lupe. We'll have a picture of Lupe there. <laughs> so, next steps. The next steps are really that we're going to continue the learning around this. As with anything new, we know that we'll have a lot of learning to do. Um, we want to build our capacity within uh, the department and, as I said, outside of the department. We really need to develop protocols so that in each of those buckets, if you will, we have protocols to help people through the system that they can sort of check off and use as tools to help as we do the work. And then we're going to jump in and we're going to build it and, and implement and <coughs> learn from it and improve because we're a learning organization and that's what learning organizations do is that we are around continuous um, learning efforts. So this is continuous improvement for us. So this is just another system putting in place like the transformation zone where uh, we have that uh, graphic on, on this slide that really, again, brings a system of where we're really making it happen with MTSS and those learner-centered supports and working on getting it from MDE to the ISDs, into the schools. And then we have our way of work in which we're bringing the work out from us, again, considering, looking at all those considerations so we can also help if we're doing our work this way, ISDs at schools can possibly look at that and also get guidance as possibilities for the work um, that they are, are doing. And then, again, just in general, these are systems to support us um, becoming a top 10 state and the last picture is really the, the bamboo. Um, you've seen the bamboo video where it takes some time to build those roots, but once you build those roots and they're very strong, then the other work goes up quickly, that bamboo shoots up, and so that's where we are like at the edge of this. We have our timelines where we're bringing these pieces through and we're hoping with having these infrastructure pieces in place that we can shoot the work <laughs> forward. Um, you have binders also. Uh, the last time Pam had asked that it would be helpful to have a binder around the 10 and 10 that you could put things in, so that's why you have three hole punches with um, your PowerPoint on this, and you'll get a binder to put that in, and we'll keep that going. So, this is an important way that we are moving our work forward, and it really does do a couple things. One, Sometimes in large organizations, you have different offices sometimes touches the same issue, and this makes sure that we're coordinated in those efforts when that happens. And we don't have one part of the department saying do X, and then another department coming in and telling districts, no, you can't do X. So that's one issue. And then two, just really getting our department working together and getting some outside sources being involved in the design and decision making as we move forward. So. This is an important way of work, and it is the direction that we're heading. Any questions, Eileen, please? Uh, so, 
because we have two new board members. Yep. Uh, and, and I would like to note that one person's tea is another person's coffee. I th I'm a right-hander, and so I'm just now reversing all the tabs because I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's really the crux of what my comments would be, which is that um, I, we have been primarily a compliance uh, organization for many years. That's what our funding is for. And within the compliance initiatives, there certainly are um, ways to seek uh, innovation. Um, and I commend the department for trying to reorganize so that work makes more sense and that there's a coherent message to the outside. I wondered what the current restricted funding split is for federal and state money for the department. I don't know that you'll have those numbers offhand, but it's a good thing to be talking about with new members here. And uh, I also wondered whether there is any dedicated funding in the state funds or the federal funds for um, innovation, uh, because I don't think there is. And so we've always talked before um, on this board about how the department can look to the spirit of the, legis the federal legislation and try to fit it to what's needed in Michigan. Um, I'm also curious as to what the level of legislative support is for switching us. Uh, some, some of this is just internal work that's really critical, which is thinking through what makes sense from, from yes. initiative to initiative or grant to grant. Yes. But in addition to that, I'm curious to see whether or not there is a will in the legislature to take us from a compliance-based organization to one that starts reaching out to schools. And I just don't know the answer to that. I don't know if we're at the base of the mountain or whether there's actually quite a bit of support. Uh, with Mark Tucker's work being discussed for the last five to seven years, people understand that um, uh, ideas have to come from someplace and that uh, while you can't force local districts to comply with ideas at the state level, if they can't access them, then it's a real problem because they can't imagine it. So there, that's the, the Good Morning uh, Michigan uh, First State Board of Ed meeting 2017. <laughs> so I think there is an understanding in the legislature that yes, we have some compliance responsibilities, but that we want to move towards more of a leadership role, more of showing best practices and letting districts make choices and providing opportunities for them to learn from successful things that other districts have done, like creating the, the warehouse of promising practices that when districts see success that we highlight that and that districts can make choices whether they want to take advantage of those successful districts options so that creating that warehouse of promising practices is something we're doing but we're certainly reaching out to districts to be more of a customer service to say what is it we can do what services can we provide how can we help you do the things you need to do to be successful so certainly that is one of my goals as, as state soup is yes we have compliance responsibilities that we must maintain state and federal laws but how can we do it in a way of a customer service so and you asked a few other questions that I wrote down that we'll get the answers to when, and I recently have been in conversations with you about the the frustrating part for districts when they get technical services from the state only to find that the person that we, the people in the pool that the state has don't understand that district and aren't able yep. to really assist them. So I know that there's, a, it's not just financial resources, it's also people. Yep. Uh, and I'm, I'll be heartened to hear uh, as we move along that, uh, how successful we can be with the, the, the resources we have. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, please. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so where are we today? If we want to get to top 10, are we 25? Well, we're somewhere between, we're at the bottom, bottom third, somewhere between 28 and 42, depending on what measure you want to use. Well, I guess that was my question. That was my next question was what, how will we know when we've arrived and so, what measurements? Uh, we can get you those. In the top 10 plan, we have what we're calling the ease, I think, and it, it, yes. it outlines the metrics that we're going to use <coughs> to judge whether we're getting there. So we'll get those to everybody. Okay. Also, what we, we hope to do is um, next week, uh, next week, month. next month, um, Steve actually will be bringing to the board um, some of the measures in our alignment with ESSA and some of those pieces. Okay. Um, and then what are we doing differently than other states? Because I'm assuming that if we are going to move from 32 to 9, we're going to do something other states aren't doing. So what innovative things are we doing that they're not doing? Well, I wouldn't say that, I wouldn't necessarily say that. You know, we, we went through a year-long process where we looked at the top building blocks, the top nine building blocks that other 
states and states and nations have used to significantly improve and you'll see those top building blocks in our plan of top 10. Uh, I think that we want to take what other states have used that has worked, see if it will work here. If it doesn't, we'll adjust as we go. But really, when you look at our 47 recommendations, there, some of them are things that other states are using, like going to early childhood, making sure that that's available for everybody, for all four-year-olds and three-year-olds, that if parents want that, they have that access. Uh, things like uh, early getting college credits as part of high schools. I think the state's a leader in that. But So there are some things other states are doing that we're, we're doing, and there are some new things that we're doing that we're pushing. And, you know, we can meet and go through the top 10 and 10 plan in more detail with you to show you those things. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, just so I'm clear, I mean, if we're doing what everybody else is doing, it's hard to move up. I mean, I, are we just trying to do the good things that everybody's doing and... I would just like to know what it is that's going to differentiate us and move us Some, up. Sometimes it's not what you're doing, but how you're doing it. And that's why we spent a lot of time on the infrastructure pieces, because we are um, part of our learning pieces. We're learning a lot about implementation science and how we also um, can assess um, the fidelity of implementation and how we are bringing it forward. So um, we have those pieces as, as well that um, a lot of times we'll say, oh, well, we're doing this. Well, how are we doing it? And um, being specific about what are evidence-based practices that really bring it forward, and then how can we make sure that we are using evidence-based practices to do that? And part of even this way of work is like looking at these are things in implementation science that you need to look at as you're bringing things forward, that you have those, those pieces in mind. And the transformation zone is helping us on a smaller scale, but really making it happen to again build some of that system and some of the learning about how we actually bring things forward to fidelity. Okay, so it's about being fidelity, not necessarily innovation or anything. No, there's innovation in there. Doing. I think it's, it's both. both. So we'll, we'll get you the information on that. I have a few logistical Nikki? questions <laughs> yep. about the infrastructure. The, the plan, the people, who are the external stakeholders? Do you have any off the you know, cuff? We, what we do is, again, trying to systemize things, is that we look at what are the perspectives that we need to have in each of the areas of work and what are the competencies that people bring and that way um, you look at those and then go to people that are external people to see who has those competencies and we'll start building a, a database. So like experts or in, in those competency areas? Mm -hmm. But um, also also some non-experts because we always so include parents, parents right. business community, you know, it's people kind of who have stake in the game, even though they may not be an expert. But we also do want to bring experts if it's an assessment issue, assessment issues. If it's a classroom, we want deeper learning in the classroom. We want classroom teachers who have demonstrated success in doing the deeper learning uh, to help lead us. So it's, it is a combination of experts, but we always want to include parents, the business communities, and other stakeholders who have a say in it but we also want the experts who have demonstrated that they've moved the needle. And that's why we do the perspectives. You want a parent perspective. You want a, an expert, you want a competency of an expert. So if doing the both, we hope that we get a well-rounded um, committee together. And then a couple of others. I think with the last time we talked, we talked about differentiated supports during the orientation. Is that the menu of services that you were referring the to? The Learner Centered Supports are sort of like a menu of services, and the differentiated supports, the biggest one is the multi-tiered systems of support. And is that menu of services available yet, or are you still working on it? We are bringing it through our system, and that's that timeline of okay. looking at um, those pieces. As we're building the transformation zone, we're doing those learnings and trying to um, ramp up our efforts around the learner centered support so that we'll be ready uh, for that as tier one. And then this infrastructure is in place for, for um, a few different di uh, ISDs, correct? What were the ISDs that we were? The, the transformation zone, we are working with ISDs and we are currently <coughs> in the exploration stage, okay. so I can't tell you who they are yet, but hope okay. to by the end of February okay. be able to bring that. Okay. All right, thank you. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, oh, yeah, I was going to say. Michelle Fuck. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just have some just very basic questions. Yep. Um, so um, this chart on well, it says timelines for strategic <laughs> planning effort. What do you what is meant by um, some of the terms like family engagement? I, I understand partnership di districts, but I'm not quite sure what is meant by family engagement, and, I, and, and that's part of the assessment process. I assume is that the family engagement. So. Could you give me more specifics about what that it's looks like? looking, and we are defining that, so we'll okay. be able to give you real specifics <coughs> after we work through our way of work. But basically, we know how important it is to have mm -hmm. families engaged in the educational process, okay. and how do we support them along the way, and how do we um, involve them in their child's education along the way, and looking at not just education, but you know what other kinds of services, like wraparound services and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank. Thank you, Michelle. Dr. Z, please. Uh, just a suggestion to whoever does this going forward. There's a lot of abstract language here. It reminds me of trying to figure out uh, you know, how a bill becomes law. And um, I've, later on, I had to teach that in middle school, and I found it helpful that you know, the law is to regulate chewing gum. And then you can follow that concrete example through the steps, which help kids and the teacher. Um, understand the process a lot better. So whoever does this in the future, because uh, it would be helpful if a, if a concrete issue or something like that would be used to illustrate yes. um, Give an example. how, you know, the resources and the communication of the stakeholders, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Dr. Zim. Tom, please. I want to circle around. Just, uh, I see a lot of questions in a lot of this. So there's a, you know, um, what are the uh, barriers? How are we going to measure progress? So it's good that we're asking questions, but I mean, it's, it's in formulation, a lot of this, right? Yes, okay. yes it is. We'll develop the protocols and we'll get more specific. Okay, because as I understand, we're going to build and we're going to deal with ESSA plan next, but I heard we're building the ESSA plan based on this, but it doesn't sound like it's fixed yet. It's still in a well, work in progress, the top 10 and 10. Please, Lupe. I, I have to commend you for uh, this presentation. I'm uh, the, the illustrations are really cool. <laughs> for a better word, uh, very. Uh, I have seen the progress from where we started to where we are now, and and I see a lot of progress. I you know I I know this is your last meeting, but uh, I think you have. Uh, taken this work from zero to five. And, and so I'm very, very um, impressed, and, and I think we're headed the right way. It does take time to formulate such a, a program, such a, an initiative, and I know that it even takes uh, a more uh, effort to combine the two together. But I know I have faith in, in the department and the superintendent and the board that we're going to get there. So I appreciate all the work that you've done in our behalf. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lupe. All right. Thank you very much. Next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is presentation on Every Student Succeeds Act Plan. This presentation provides a high-level overview of the work to date on Michigan's Every Student Succeeds Act Plan. It highlights areas of stakeholder agreement and plans for further discussion on those areas where consensus has not yet been reached. It also includes feedback received from recent stakeholders engagement activities, including focus group meetings, surveys, and the regional feedback forums that we've held. You know, we have really done a very thorough process of engaging the community uh, stakeholders in helping us develop this, and so I'm very proud of that. Uh, we've been recognized from, uh, by other organizations around the country as being a state that's ahead of the game in terms of really engaging the whole community, not just parts of it. So good work, Vanessa and uh, your team. So Vanessa will make a presentation. I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege. Can you guys stand up, please? I want to introduce my kids. It's a snow day in East Lansing. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> They're here with me. I'm not going to make them sit through the presentation, although maybe it'll be nicer to me if I leave them at the table with me. Uh, but this is, oh, this is my soda. Thank you. This is my daughter, Rose. She's in sixth grade. And this is my son, JJ. He's in second. So, ah, yeah. welcome. Yeah, thank you. And I would just like to add that this is why you have this job, to make sure that those children get the education they deserve. That's right. That is exactly Good right. Point. And that all Michigan students have the kind of opportunities mm -hmm. that they have. You know, I think we're very, um, 
I'm regularly reminded that I'm very blessed or privileged or whatever the word is to have access to the things that I do and have my kids have that access and growing up in a much uh, much more poor home and area and economically disadvantaged community I, I'm I all if you ask them all the time I say you have no idea how lucky you are <laughs> uh, you need to be grateful and yeah. that go, that's about as effective as it ever is when you tell your kids that but <laughs> someday they'll understand so okay so we just have a little bit to cover in this presentation. It's, it's not much. Um, that's a joke. It's a lot. And I apologize. But uh, we did want to bring you um, a summary of where we're at, like the superintendent said, what we've uh, achieved consensus on. And by consensus, we mean broad agreement that that's the direction we're going uh, in terms of the ESSA plan. And then there are some areas where we really don't have consensus or we haven't reached a decision point. And so we need to focus our attention on the things that we aren't sure about while we start implementing some of the things that we are. So um, some of these, yes? I hate to hit you with a question right off. Do I need who, to bring my kids back? <laughs> uh, I would like to meet them later. Uh, anyway, no, just what are the, who are the parties of the consensus or non-consensus? So we had a good discussion about this yesterday. Um, there are areas, and if we, you all have a white paper, or you will have a white paper in front of you that kind of outlines this and the PowerPoint does. There are places where it, after all of the stakeholder engagement and all of the discussions, things that people don't seem to ask questions about, things that seem like we've found some. But as people who served on the various committees, yep. volunteered and all the to serve on the committees, you know, then we had the forums mm -hmm. where it was just open forums for people yep. to come speak to at, and we had the online surveys and online opportunities right. for people right so really a variety of yeah. opportunities so all of these everything around the circle um and then like the superintendent just said all of the stakeholder input through the two rounds of survey two rounds of feedback and then we just did the seven forums so things where people seem to say yeah that seems like a good idea versus well i'm not really sure about that idea um not everything in this plan will reach consensus a lot of things and i i actually um had to label it consensus slash decision. On some of them, it, it's about making a decision and knowing that that will, um, it will move us forward and we'll have to choose a direction, but it may not be something, there, there will not be true consensus around everything. But we do have areas where we've reached general agreement, where people seem to understand, feel like that's a positive step and there isn't residual kind of concerns being raised, so. So if I understand you, the parties we're speaking of are the feedback generally and then the representatives uh, that have been convened to review this material. Mm -hmm. And our internal um, teams, the all of the uh, organizations that we've been speaking with, the board, I mean things that we brought to you guys that you've said hmm, seems reasonable or or you've said I like the direction but I have a couple you know implementation <coughs> considerations so again as we go through if there's an area that you say I don't think we have consensus then we'll move it over to the other column but um, and that is the other purpose of this presentation is to try to, after so much discussion over so many months, put things into boxes. Like, I think we're pretty settled on this. We think we're pretty settled, and here's where we're not. But it's a, it's a, it's a test in the sense of if we can't agree to it, then we know where we are and we know where we're not. Just a little tiny bit of brief background, um, keeping in mind what the superintendent said about new board members and anybody who's joining us new. Um, there's a little bit of ESSA context. So, it, the law did reauthorize No Child Left Behind and is reauthorized through 2020. Uh, ESSA still includes high academic standards, accountability, uh, focus on low performing schools and subgroups. It does still include annual assessment. Um, and so we'll talk about that when we get to the areas of discussion still a little bit more. But the big key with ESSA that we have worked towards, certainly under the superintendent's leadership, is uh, empowering state and local decision makers to have strong systems. So how can we build um, a structure and a, a, and a framework, but give a lot of um, decision making to the districts and to schools. <coughs> we are continuing along our journey. We are in the December to January um, realm, and you'll know interact with federal guidance. I'll talk about that more as well, and moving into phase four. And then Dr. Ziley asked about this. Um, these are all of our, this has been our kind of way of engaging. So you see around the outside there's stakeholder engagement, and that's where you encompass the truthfully thousands of people who um, have engaged with surveys or forums. We are working, as we said last month now, with Public Policy Associates to do some deeper dive focus groups with area, um, teacher or parents and teachers and um, students and some, some uh, pardon? Paraprofessionals, thank you, Alison. Um, areas where we felt like we haven't had the deep engagement that we want, so we're very excited to have that support. 
Um, we've kept the child at the center through this plan. We see the things that ESSA gives us as vehicles to accomplish those 10 and 10 goals. So we don't have assessment just to have assessment. We have it to drive towards certain goals as an example. And we want to keep the learner at the center and leverage not only our resources, but a wider range of organizations. And we believe we can get to improve child outcomes that are measured not only by test scores, but by <coughs> factors related to safety, well-being, access to resources and experience as a learner and a citizen. So like I said, today I will briefly summarize areas where we have consensus or superintendent decision and then outline the key areas where we need to focus our discussion and give us that roadmap for the next months. I, I will try not to go into deep deal, detail on the areas of consensus um, just in the interest of, of time, um, but we can return to cycle back to any of them or we can discuss it offline. And again, I have a paper for you that flushes these out a little bit more. But we have agreed that we want to focus on the whole child and that we need to revise our comprehensive needs assessment to do that and make it more whole child focused. And we need to get to try to get to one or as few as possible. We have too many right now. We want to drive districts toward those evidence-based 10 in 10 practices but allow space for innovation. We want that flexibility for districts based on the results of the CNA. So if you identify a need, you have more flexibility in spending your federal funds and more guidance from the department and kind of uh, blending and braiding your funding streams. And we want to do reduced reporting and administrative burden for districts. So one comprehensive CNA that happens less frequently, less frequent submissions of school and district improvement plans, and a revised and streamlined grant processes. The supports for special populations um, that we need that needs assessment in the overall comprehensive needs assessment, um, that they are provided the supports and increase access in early childhood programs and that we provide professional development and technical assistance to, um, to school districts in serving all of their special populations. And here we really mean English language learners, migrant, homeless, um, foster youth. There's a, a set of, of students who, um, there's both mandates, uh, legal mandates of how we need to identify and serve those students as well as just an imperative to make sure that those, those kids are getting access to um, the kind of supports they need from the educational system. The Title IV block grant, um, this is partly an area of consensus, partly something that has happened to us. Um, what happened in the law, the federal law, is that 49 former individual grant opportunities that were in ESEA are being consolidated into one block grant system at the federal level. So um, we, w whether or not we wanted that to happen is kind of irrelevant, it happened. And so we've, <laughs> we've agreed that we want to uh, work to make sure that districts have guidance to, to use that to support well-rounded education for all students. So this is kind of just a piece of work that we need to do and help districts transition from older funding streams to new funding streams and choose how they spend these funds to support this well-rounded education. Um, educator quality. So we, every time we present on educator quality, and we've done it here at the, um, at the board table as well, we get agreement on these big four areas so that it's important to have a high, um, high quality education preparation provider and P12 partnerships, to have a system of supported transitions from pre-service to the profession. Superintendent, one of his early goals was some, some more supported um, um, mentoring model or he called it the medical model early on of, of new teachers so they have more support in those early years. So the team has worked to flesh out what a supported transition could look like. Um, develop and utilize teacher leadership roles, and then establish and support a pipeline of high potential, aspiring, and highly effective practicing principles. So we've agreed that those are all things that are very important for Michigan's education workforce. We do have work to do on exactly how the implementation and what the details are. So um, we've achieved consensus that we want to work on these things. How we're going to work on them is, is still work to be done. And then we have agreed about the importance of accountability to drive support to schools and districts and that we want to change the level of support by need. So I think Norma Jean referenced in her presentation the kind of making it happen, helping it happen, letting it happen. And the idea of partnership districts is very intensive support for our districts who most need it. And then a more broadly applied partnership model for all districts with targeted assistance from us based on area of need. And really trying to move beyond labeling and into this collective accountability and supports. You've heard me say it at this table, um, Accountability alone will not help schools change, will not help districts change. It, it is the purpose of accountability is to hold us all accountable on things that are important in the system and help us identify where those supports need to go. But if the supports don't go there, then there won't be a different label the next time you run the system. 
So we just have to, we, I think we've agreed that we want to move beyond that, but this is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, we can spend a lot of time debating about the system, the accountability system, and that's important. But more important, I would argue, is the so what. And we've agreed through this process that we want to be very intentional about the so what. We've also agreed that we need a transparency dashboard. Um, what's on it is still what we're developing, but we've agreed we need one. We want this alternate accountability system for um, schools um, that uh, fit the definition of an, alter al uh, an alternate school. So for example, an alternative high school or a center-based program, somewhere where the traditional, mo the accountability model really doesn't fit exactly. Um, so we're, we, want, we have one that we've been developing for several years and want to propose through ESSA. Um, this is a decision point that might be new to some of you. Uh, we had been discussing for a long time PSAT 8th 9 as the 8th grade test in lieu of the uh, state created ELA and math assessment and that's a, that has, that's a decision point we're moving forward with that we want to move in that direction. Um, let me finish the last two, Dr. Z, and then I'll, I'll get you. Uh, equitable services to private schools. Again, we need to do it, but we want to do this well, so we're working to hire an ombudsman, and then this government-to-government -government consultation, um, doing a better job of working with Michigan's 12 tribal nations uh, to serve the needs of indigenous students in, in the state. Okay, do you want to ask me questions on areas of consensus? I know Dr. Z just raised his hand. Just comment on the, on the significance, if any, of uh, moving from the state-centered, the state-created test, which is criterion reference, versus an aptitude test, which uh, uh, measures basically measures students against one another. So um, some of this is in the paper that you'll get to. There was a long discussion with lots of parties, and the basic pros cons come down to came down to the PSAT in eighth grade allows you to understand your tracking toward that career and college readiness and get that that trans supports the transitions <laughs> and that early look toward how we help kids get on track. And there's a lot of research that shows of the importance of middle school and starting with college and career readiness sooner. Um, the con side was just what you said. Our state developed test is criterion reference and covers our content standards. The PSAT 89 does not in the same way. It's not built to do that. Both statements are true and both statements have value. So it's been one of those kind of like, they, that is both right. So I think now uh, knowing the benefit that the PSAT 89 can bring, we have to move into implementation considerations. You know, what content doesn't it cover? Uh, what are the considerations that you're pointing out, Dr. Z, about um, what the PSAT 89 is versus what a state test is and what we do about it to make sure um, that we still support kids in the way they need to, so. The thought is that there's enough overlap between these two different <coughs> kinds of tests that to have them both would be redundant, is that the Feeling yes, I mean, it, they would be at that point. Again, the PSAT 89 does not test our content standards in their entirety, but they do test some part of it. To, so to completely give both as they are now would be duplicative testing. It would not support the reduced testing time goals. Um, one of the implementation considerations we have to look at is what wraparound testing might be needed or supplemental testing. Uh, PSAT 89 doesn't include writing, for example. So. There, again, the superintendent just kind of made a, a call on this, so now the charge to the team is figure out how this would look and contractual vehicles and how we do this. Um, but that, that alignment of data and the interest from the education organization community, I would say, was very strong that this will help us help students with their transitions. So, Thank you. Yep. Michelle, please. I think so, Vanessa. Um, so I, I had some questions around the assessment and or holding accountable, and and um, you know I, I read this morning that Senator Pavlov was going to be introducing a bill um, to sort of you know um, to, to to reconsider this top to bottom list and the tests, and um, and I also um, I know you've presented before on the accountability standards that would be used and. Um, the high stakes testing is always uh, is a concern because I believe it provide it, it creates um, incentives, strong incentives, and also unintended consequences. Um, so, I, I I'm hoping we can revisit the, what the final um, mm -hmm. standards for accountability will look like, yep. and um, and and have and the, the board have a voice on those, uh, a strong voice on those <coughs> before they're submitted. 
Um, and I wanted to ask why um, and if uh, class size, which is a proven, you know, there's a lot of research that supports a smaller class size, but it provides greater um, academic outcomes. Um, if, and also I, I haven't seen a discussion around uh, special education and how that will be assessed and how, given the different funding formats and mm -hmm. how we're gonna make sure that that's delivered um, in, in, a, in a way that uh, has really good outcomes and, and is also complies with the law. So. so your question about assessment and accountability was a great segue into the second part okay. of the discussion, which is areas <laughs> for continued <laughs> discussion, <laughs> uh, okay. of which those are probably the two largest um, okay. remaining. And then um, in terms of class size, um, Really, with ESSA, if a district identifies that their problem is that they have too big of class size, they can leverage some of their federal funds to do class size reduction um, strategies, so hiring other teachers or those sorts of things. Again, the, the point, the, the goal is to not say, here's what you have to do, districts, and here's a one-size-fits-all model that will work for all of you. It's really a data-based diagnosis of your strengths and then your areas of weakness and then matching of evidence-based strategies um, to that area of, of weakness and using your federal funds and your state funds more um, holistically to do that and how the department can help facilitate that process. It's a harder answer to give than yes, we're gonna make sure everybody reduces class size um, because for some of our districts that are struggling, class size isn't their problem. Um, for some it is. So and for some it's class size plus hungry kids or you know, so we really wanna encourage districts to do that true root cause analysis and figure out how to best move forward on all sorts of student outcomes. So class size reduction is certainly on the table, it's, but it's not a prescribed, everybody do this. But can I just follow yep. um, I was just thinking a way to incentivize um, good practices, and, mm -hmm. you know, um, as, as opposed. So if there's different approaches, I mean, and we're looking at, you know, not only how different districts are doing compared to other districts in the right. state or schools, but also looking at our state compared to others, mm -hmm. if we're gonna be top 10 and 10. But if all states have different <laughs> sorts of measures, yeah. how do you do that? I'm that's, a, that's a really good question, and I kind of blazed by this, but one of, and Norma Jean referenced it in her presentation, one big, the other big component of this is what are your needs? That's one. And then the other is what are the evidence-based practices that you should consider using? And how do we create a kind of a super highway of matching of good evidence-based practices to identified needs? The problem becomes, you just highlighted, evidence base is hard in education. It is hard to conclusively prove what works, and then there's always context. So what works in your district might not work in somebody else's district. So um, we want to strengthen our approach to evidence base, more tools for districts and understanding what good evidence is, and also some strategies that we want to incentivize, like a good multi-tiered system of support. That will always be something we'll be checking for in districts, because we know it's a practice that helps improve student achievement. So. It's, it's not a short yeah. answer. Um, we'd be using te test scores, like the test scores. Yeah, for that's the another good point. That in order to compare, is that what? We're no, I mean I think when you talk about an evidence base, some of it comes from how are you doing on your test, but some of it comes from other. You know, if you if you implement a behavioral intervention, you would expect to see change in suspension rates, for example. Okay. So what is the outcome we're watching to understand if the intervention is working? Sometimes it's a test score, but sometimes it's or it's something as an intermediary outcome and then an eventual outcome. And the state would be able to do something to follow up if people are falling short? That is our idea. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now moving into the, the areas left for discussion, and Michelle helpfully teed this one up for us. Um, we still have some discussion to do on the assessment system. So again, in the paper that we'll give you, there's a whole text on this, but um, a brief summary of where we've been on this. As the superintendent started, um, 18 months ago now, he came in and he said, I wanna make sure that we have assessments that mirror what we want for our students as learners, as citizens, um, and that, that we are, the, that the assessment provides um, relevant and timely data to students, to teachers, to parents, to taxpayers, and um, that we are able to understand growth better. That was another, those are kind of his three big things. There were a lot of pieces, but um, more information and growth data because that helps you understand how a student performed within the year. Really it's more fair to teachers and schools and districts to say here's where they came in and here's where they finished. Um, that talks about what the school's been able to accomplish during the year. So we know that. Um, we did, as you all recall, the RFI. We found um, 
a variety of solutions coming from vendors, a variety of readiness from vendors, particularly around accommodations. So at this point, and we won't, I will say this presentation is to lay out for you a path where we need to have discussion. We won't, I'm not, we can get into this, but this isn't per se to solve all of these things today. That would require a three hour board item. Um, we still need to figure out the exact design of the system. So there are some, there's questions about how often would we need to do a summative assessment. Um, some proposals have been use a spring comprehensive benchmark in certain years. That's a, still a shorter test, but it's a little bit longer, covers more content standards. Um, the superintendent's original vision had certain grades that only had benchmark assessment. So are we, do, you know, how would that work? Um, particularly with the concept of a spring comprehensive benchmark, a slightly longer benchmark. And then the other thing that happened is that um, the third grade reading bill passed between when the vision was articulated and now, and so we need to do some work on what, what does that mean. Um, it put much higher stakes on that third grade test than was originally designed in the superintendent's vision. And then we've been having this discussion on these benchmark assessments about would they be required or would they be optional. Um, so would everybody be required to take them or would some of them be optional? Again, the superintendents had a lot of discussion. We've had a lot of discussion, but these are places where there's still, still discussion to be had. <laughs> um, I did want to touch on this briefly. There, there is a lot of question about what about the federal requirements. And there's been an interesting push-pull as we've gone through this process where I will sit in a stakeholder meeting and someone will say, well, why are we dancing to the feds tune and someone else will say we can't do that because the feds say no and it is it's been an interesting kind of dichotomy to try to not dance to their tune but also not run so far afield that we have a consequence we don't want and then added into that is just the complete uncertainty and the prognostication that's going on about what will or won't happen at the federal level so here's superintendent and i had a chance to talk about this in some length the other day this, this assessment plan Somewhat, sometimes to my, um, my nervousness, the superintendent did not build his assessment plan, our assessment plan, to the federal regulations. He talked to, he's been talking about what Michigan needs for Michigan students. So our plan is not overly engaged with the regs as they are now or not. In fact, there's many things we're proposing that are gray in the current regs because they were things that we decided we wanted to move forward on. Um, so I think that's one thing. The other one, I think we need to spend some time in January on these questions. Let's pretend that the federal requirements did disappear and we no longer had to do testing for any federal money, just went away. What would we want to do with its assessment, our assessment system? What do we want to do? So questions, how frequently should all Michigan students be assessed on one subjects? You all remember MEEP used to be only given in certain subject or certain subjects in certain grades. Um, would we support a sampling method where not all students are assessed each year? Um, or not all students are assessed on all content. If you do that, that means you can't get those individual student scores each year. Would we be okay with that? I mean, these are questions we haven't engaged with because they're not allowed in our current federal and state law. But if feds went away and all we had was state, then we need to have this discussion. How often do we want to be able to run school accountability? And what assessment data should go in that system? If you're not assessing every year, then when you run the A to F system, it's based on only some students' grades or scores. Maybe that's okay, maybe it's not. And then how are we going to address our persistent achievement gaps and overall low performance on those national comparisons? And how does or does not the assessment system support that work? So again, if we don't assess every student every year, do we lose some ability to understand gaps, progress, student performance, or do we gain it in some other way? I'm really posing these questions as what I see as the things we have to talk about as a state. If we, so again, we will move forward with some plan in the federal plan. We don't know if they'll say yes, no, if they'll be shut down. If I, but if they are gone, what do we want to do? What do we Michigan want to do? And I, we haven't had that discussion because there are federal laws and a lot of money that's important to us is tied to that. And because we have, I think as a system up till now, said it's important to assess students every year. But I think it's time to ask ourselves that question and look at the implications of if we didn't. So. Again, that's where we're going to spend the next few weeks is talking about this sort of thing. Um, yes. Is it fair, oh, to, fair to interrupt for a second? Sure. So uh, I am incredibly impressed with the quality of the discussions that have been underway. I'm delighted that um, 
that Michigan schools agree with as much as they do. And I have no doubt that we're going to be wrestling with this for some time to come. Um, the board is considering having Yang Zhao in. Um, I don't know whether he'll have um, a focus on this or not. But what, what strikes me all the time on assessment is that because we're a local control state, we're always trying to push from behind. And I just wondered within the ESSA plan whether there's any way to start trying to tease from in front, which is to um, do better training of teachers, um, encourage in some way that districts do better professional development, um, find some incentives that can move. I know that that's how you're trying, you're looking at ESSA, but I, I just, I, I, I think we're placing a huge burden on rear door, you're mm -hmm. not doing it right. Mm -hmm. And what I'd love to see is front door, here's why this is such a good uh, right. situation, better for you and better for <coughs> children. Right. I, I marvel, the, the, it turns out that the Ottawa presentation that was right after yours on December 1st, I think I just saw an email from House Ed TV that that may be available for board members to watch. But, um, and I recognize that you're gonna be trading that information back and forth, but to see that teacher saying this works for me in my classroom and it's successful and it's given me a whole new lease on my professional life is really compelling and I don't see us doing that with assessment I don't see how we're going to be encouraging those conversations right so you're right that when we've talked here we tend to talk about the part of the, the end step for its, its successor or whatever um, an equally huge part of the system that we have been dealing with with ESSA is the formative assessment and the professional learning and the assessment literacy. And this board adopted assessment literacy standards, I think last year, mm -hmm. for that purpose. Because we, I, I, to repeat myself at the table, we can build any assessment we want and if teachers don't know how to do formative assessment and they don't know how to use the data coming out of whatever tool we give them, it is not a useful enterprise for us as a state. So we have been developing professional learning. I, I have goals about really like prescriptive professional learning that is part of our reorg conversation about how we be more intentional around professional learning as a department. Uh, we have the standards so that gives us that ability to design. And then I think we need to invest more state funds in that formative assessment training. We have a FAME a project called FAME right now that is all about that, that gets great results. I should bring in um, some of our favorite, our, our FAME advocates. Um, you're absolutely right that we talk a lot about this part of the system, but this is potentially the least impactful part of the system, although it's the most expensive part of the system and the most political. The impactful part of the system are those instructionally relevant formative assessment practices and a teacher's ability to use assessment in a powerful way in his or her classroom. Well, and we have to, we are spending more time there, but our, our discussions have focused on kind of this. Oh, so. just a personal point. Uh, I remember the Teacher of the Year in 2005 talking about how he discovered that the department wasn't teaching all of the essential components of Algebra 1. And he said, how can you learn Algebra 2 unless you've been exposed to and taught, um, at least taught, maybe you didn't learn it, but at least exposed and taught the concepts of Algebra 1. And this strikes me as a basic toolkit. Yeah. This, is, this is just, I mean, <laughs> Stacey's nodding her head, but uh, you can't figure out where your class isn't heading unless you are able to do this, mm -hmm. and we don't have right. the ability to help make sure that everybody has this yeah. skill. Our educator prep institutions are required to expose candidates to data and assessment practices. That being said, I think it's one of those supported transitions into the profession that data in a classroom in your prep program is different than your district is using this kind of formative assessment system or this kind of benchmark assessment system. So that's where that targeted and really strategic professional learning and that bridge between prep and practice and a unified vision for the state becomes really important. Okay, assessment, one big area for discussion. <laughs> Accountability, second big area for discussion. Um, the current proposal that we put forward through ESSA, as you've all heard before, is an A to F grading system. Um, with multiple components and grades in each of those components along with this transparency dashboard. So just a couple things that we do reaffirm our commitment to that this purpose of accountability is to identify schools where there are needs and drive supports, collective accountability, um, that we need to make sure the accountability system incentivizes things in the 10 and 10. Um, we should use the results of the accountability system to make strategic investments where necessary and we should make the system as transparent and as simple as possible yet fair. Okay, again, we all agree with that. Then we get into, so what? Um, brief summary of this discussion as well, and again, this is a repeat for some of you, and I apologize, but um, there has been a great deal of 
back and forth on how Michigan should approach its, its accountability system. And there's been a lot of discussion specifically on the value of A to F. Um, last fall, after the Detroit legislation was passed, and given the legislature's and the governor's interest in A to F and the opportunity to design something with ESSA, superintendent and the department, we all worked on this, we said we will work to design an A to F system that does those things from the slide before, the things that are important. We want to design what's in the system and we want to work toward one system. We don't want to end up with a state system and a federal system and another system and we need to get to one. We even have too many systems right now. So um, we want to retire the top to bottom ranking and the scorecard. We want to go to one system that everybody can agree on or agree as much as possible. So we did work to build an A to F system with these components. And then, um, and I will show you a, a early mock-up in a minute. Um, and then we plan to do additional reporting comparing schools to other similar schools. So this is an early mock-up. This is not the final, but so you can see kind of how it would be. And we've looked at other states and how they do it. Um, but you would have an overall grade, and then these are the components would be student proficiency, student growth, graduation rate, English learner progress, school quality and student success, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and then assessment participation. And you can kind of see up in the corner, there's some of that comparison to similar schools. Where are you? This, um, this particular borrows from the quadrant model that we proposed early on and also um, has um, similarities to the work that they've done with the Reading Now Network of kind of here, well, it's a little bit different, but here's where you are and here's where some comparison schools are. There are a lot of things to still decide in this system. One is the weighting for each component. And the superintendent has clearly signaled he has ideas. He wants to collect the last, we're collecting feedback right now on the weighting. So when we have all that in and these types of things, how much should growth be weighted? How much should proficiency be weighted? Um, but those are probably the two big ones, but then how much we just need to decide on the weighting. We have a proposed weighting out there, um, but that is, that is outstanding for decision and, and discussion. Um, how to treat subgroups. Right now, in each of those components on that mock-up, uh, subgroups are included throughout it. So you get points on the performance of your subgroups in each component, it kind of adds up. So, and then we use a, a partial credit system where you get credit for each kid who gets where you need them to go as opposed to this kind of yes or no dichotomous decision that there used to be. Um, is that good? Is that good enough? Do we want a stronger <laughs> treatment of subgroups or do we not like, we just have not focused a lot on how we're addressing subgroups and knowing that we do have persistent achievement gaps, it's something we need to make sure we're all on the same page about or at least we understand the implications of the decision we've made. Graduation rates. Um, the rates themselves have a certain calculation and also we use four, five, and six, but again, the superintendent has some interest in um, looking at that. Others, stakeholders have proposed things like more weight on graduation, less weight on graduation, um, a graduation rate that is the percent of kids graduating who are career and college ready on the SAT. That's one that's been proposed. So, we have, so to make it meaningful, so we have some discussion remaining there. Participation consequences, again, we need to have all kids participating in the assessment or else it's, it's not reliable information. Um, but so what happens when you don't? And the superintendent has a couple ideas on that. Um, other groups do as well, so we have to finish that discussion. And then the additional indicator. Um, okay, sorry, I thought I had, it's in the paper. The additional indicator is that school quality student success where we propose teacher and administrator longevity uh, chronic absenteeism and the completion of credits toward a post-secondary credential. We talked about this last month. Um, we just need to decide yes, no on those and then look at kind of exact business rules for that. So just a few topics to finish in okay. the accountability system. Can I just <laughs> jump yes, Tom. in here and uh, just while we're here because I've got a lot of other questions, but uh, on this one, this is, uh, you know, all these different uh, ideas about how, how to wait different things and 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 as you wait them there's all there's unintended consequences of then there's focus on that and not on other things mm -hmm. and when you and then so I, I think that is why uh, when you're done with this or at some point I've talked to you and others about really not having uh, a, somebody decide what is important uh, but just laying it out there and not coming up with an overall grade um, because I I think it's a little bit uh, I don't know if it's condescending, but I, I think it's presumptuous to assume that we know 
or if somebody in Lansing knows what is important to parents uh, for their children. So I just want to interject. Well, and that's a, a question. Oh, sorry. Will you be presenting the official ideas that you have for waiting for each component? Um, they uh, I'm are. I'm sorry, Nikki, I didn't hear you. Sorry, I was just asking her if she would. If, if eventually we'll have a presentation on the waiting. Oh yes. In your and also in the paper that we're going to hand out, they're listed. The current weights are. And it's in this chart listed. right here it's too. It's in this chart here too. There's but yes, we'll have when we come with a final recommendation, we'll have discussion on it. Yeah. So where we are now is the committee proposed the weights that we brought forward. <laughs> now we're going to need to propose alternatives to that and come to some consensus or decision if we can't get to consensus on how we do it. Um. And I think uh, Representative, or, sorry, Mr. McMillan, um, <laughs> Habit, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, you outlined the point of this. There's been a lot of discussions about should we do ADAF grading, should we not. Um, there are countless alternatives, and what, sometimes this discussion turns into other people coming in and being like, you could do it like this. And we're like, yes. Yes, yeah. we could do it many other ways. Um, there's other types of overall indicators. We've used a number of different ones in our systems, like colors <coughs> right now. Um, you can avoid one overall indicator together, and you can use multiple indicators. Um, if I were to distill the conversation down to its most simplest, the pros to one indicator is it's simple and it's transparent to parents and stakeholders. Um, and those who are supportive of one indicator will say that every time, like you need to be able to just look and know. Uh, the cons is school performance is not well summarized in one letter grade or in one color or in one anything. The school performance is a diverse topic. Um, this, like the PSAT, both are right about, like the pro is right and the con is right. Everybody's perspective has validity, um, but we have to pick a system. We can't have a system that has a grade and doesn't have a grade. We're going to have to go one way or the other. At the present time, the superintendent's charge to our team was to produce this A to F grading system with one final summative grade and components of the system that have a letter grade attached to them as well. So that's this mock-up you see is based on that. But he knows, we know that this is where we're still having discussion as we, as we finalize this part of the plan. And I'm even, just for the record, even uncomfortable with the, the letter grades in the sub areas as well. And I, I, I hope those will be discussed too. So I, to that point, how do you determine that an 84.5% student growth is a B? Because that seems pretty good to me. Um, how do you, uh, the only, it, it seems to me looking at this, the only way you could ever reach an A is on participation. Um, so, it, you know, are we creating a system, uh, you know, going back after 9-11 when we had five colors, we're really only at three because two of them were never used. Right. So are we, are we getting ourselves back into that situation again? In early modeling that we've done on the proposed system, it distributes like a normal distribution, so a small, smallish number, 10%, 15% A's, about that many F's, and then the most are C's, and then less on B and D. Well, how do you determine, I, that's my question though, is like how do you know that an 84% student growth rate shouldn't be an A because in the reality, yeah. you're only going to get 90% you know, overall anyway. Or like the superintendent said, maybe growth should, be, should count for more points. Yeah. Literally, the committee proposed a grading system that mimics a grading system you would know. So 90 and above is an A. You know, 80 to 90 is a B. Like, grading it's system. Overly simplistic. Um, my okay. other question that I have real quick is... Um, uh, one of the, the challenges we had with No Child Left Behind was that schools that started off doing very well um, ultimately ended up being labeled failures because they couldn't reach that benchmark because to reach that benchmark, um, basically it was such a small number of students who, who needed to show improvement to get there that it was very difficult. Um, and, and that's the other concern that I have here is that we're kind of setting ourselves up for that um, failure again that schools that are doing outstanding and really well, um, they're not going to show a huge student growth number from year to year. So does that mean they're automatically going to no, get No, that would be in the system. So, I mean, if you were already at the high performing, we wouldn't expect to see that growth. Right. Currently so what we do be, is if you are already proficient and you maintain, you count as growing or something. It's a little bit different with student growth. Yeah. But yes, we have recognized that if a, a proficient that. student stays proficient. You should be rewarded, not that's penalized. That's good. Right. <laughs> exactly. But you, I think you, um, everybody is identifying well, we things even that are challenging to, we about We haven't even talked about socioeconomic and adding those into right. the rankings as well. Um, right. I don't know if we are 
Well, and again, it's not a ranking are we gonna, now. Are, are but we suggesting that as well? The current proposal is that you would not alter the grade based on how many socioeconomically dis or economically disadvantaged students you had, but you, we would provide some of this comparison to similar schools up at the top so you could understand I'm a B, but most schools like me are Cs, and I'm doing better. What, what are the quadrants that you have? It's proficiency, sorry, it. yeah. it's proficiency and growth. proficiency and growth. And that's just a, I mean, we could do that slightly differently, but early, the early, early accountability vision group that superintendent pulled together a year ago liked the concept of the quadrants for understanding um, school performance. So. But if I'm hearing you correctly, if I have an 84.5% student growth one year and I have an 85% student growth the next year, um, that's not going to get me an A. That's going to keep me at a B. No, I don't think that's, oh, 85, yeah. I mean, I guess there's what's built in here is not a uh, change over years. It is get to a certain percentage or get to a certain cutoff, but. Maybe I don't understand what we mean by student growth, because I'm thinking student Percent of students who grew in your school. So, yeah, did, so yeah. if you're at 85, you're not growing On, on one no, test, no. right? Like on percent one of, test? Um, percent of students who grew not it's not that no, they were at 85 and they went higher it's that they grew they at least maintained where they were from year to year if they were in this part of the distribution this year and this part it's the same so how many kids grew at least a year so that's why we're talking about a having year. a benchmark assessment at the beginning of the year an optional benchmark in January and then probably a summative uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, a longer comprehensive benchmark, benchmark comprehensive a, benchmark yeah. so it's actually up to three tests that would show it Two would be required. Would the optional be for students that you go, hmm, I want to make sure you're doing what you need to be doing type of thing. Is right. that what it would be? Right. It will be optional for districts to decide. But oh, I, if I were yeah. a district or a school, I would use it would to that, right. <laughs> that kind of way. So it isn't just taking one test in one day. It's where did I start the year at and did I get that year's worth of growth or what I got nine-tenths of a year or whatever it is growth. When I said one test, I meant one we're deciding which subjects are important. It's the state, one state test, it's the state's test is gonna yes. decide this and yes, to the exclusion of other subjects that people may feel is important, we're, we're, set, we're deciding what is real important for growth. Well, right now the feds are deciding what's important and if they give us that flexibility, it allows us to have more conversation. Right. But I'm always willing to push the envelope because I don't care what the feds have to say. I mean, we could certainly test in more subjects, but that would be against our goals of reduced testing time. <laughs> And also when you get into outside of ELA math, science, and social studies testing, testing in the fine arts, testing in gym, no, testing, I, you know. I wouldn't suggest that. What about, so, yeah. So does this give room, are you suggesting courses like machine, metals, other, other types well, of Well, those things go, are going away more and more as we focus, focus. on yeah. one no, Actually, they're growing. They're That's, expanding. They are growing considerably. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't see our office well, here. I don't know but about all the other things as well, art and well, and the, and the nice thing about ESSA is it has given us, we've met with the, uh, the arts educators, we've met with the, um, the math science, well, they're math science, but the arts educators in particular, and looked at ways um, to make sure that schools are not um, narrowing their curriculum to the tested subjects and that they're infusing arts education and other subjects Art, music, into, yeah. into their curriculum. That's something we will be looking at in the partnership. Yeah. And also things like um, the inclusion of holding them accountable on that those courses that count toward college is another way of saying it's not just about tests in these subjects, it's about these other things that are important. So I think with ESSA we've actually tried to step back and think about the well-rounded education the whole child in a different way. Okay, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I, I often think you have the hard, hardest job in uh, any of the other areas, so I appreciate all your work and trying to get so many disparate opinions aligned um, and that said I, I um, so I, I need to get a better understanding of what my understanding is with the, with ESSA and the federal government was giving more flexibility to the states to determine mm -hmm. um, but there's some requirements to still have testing yes um, but the assessment of that or the accountability which seems like a fine line to me um, we so I, I, I'm trying to get a clarification. Must we use standardized test scores? Must we use growth? 
is that a requirement yeah. of the federal government? So let me answer that in two ways. Yeah. Yes, it is currently a requirement of the federal regulations. Right. I would say if those federal regu regulations disappeared, there is certainly strong support in the state from some corners for the continued use of standardized testing and academic measures for right. accountability. Right. Yeah. So yes, we have federal law, but if that disappeared, I don't think that's like, oh, Michigan doesn't want to do it at all. Nobody in Michigan wants to do it. It's only because of the feds. Not everybody here wants to do it. That is for sure. But there are certainly there's certainly strong support for an academic measure. So, so, so the but the percentages of have it ha, as much of it. Uh, that's up to us. That's up to us. So yes. why not look at the American Statistical Association and what they say about both value added measures and um, proficiency, mm -hmm. which they say it's like less than twenty percent. You know what I mean? That 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 to to count these uh, these standardized tests at such a high. Um, uh, strong um, component of the overall assessment is not statistically, um, uh, you know, I guess fair, yep. um, be given all the variables that uh, that are involved. Sure. So why aren't we looking at maybe lowering those those um, uh, rates, those components, yep. um, and looking at what I care about as a mother and and, and as a parent, which is you know. Um, how robust is the special ed services and how, how, how good is their uh, efforts around inclusion and diversity and how well do they work <coughs> with um, special needs populations and foster kids and um, how, and I think, and I think any parent, regardless if you go to a <laughs> private school or a public school, you're going to look at class size. That's the selling point um, mm -hmm. and because that is what is critical to I think having really differentiated education and all these other things. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think having a library with a certified librarian, it, which has been shown to uh, support um, uh, 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 literacy. Thank you. <laughs> I'm having problems finding my words. So, and, and then of course, you know, do they have arts programs? How, um, how uh, much of a full education and um, uh, are they providing? Right. In to, to do that, to incentivize schools, all schools, um, to do these things. Yeah. Because right now the incentive to me in the, in the um, unintended consequences by giving such a large chunk to these standardized test scores um, is it becomes, you know, the be all end all. Mm -hmm. and, and to the detriment of other programs that I think as a parent is, a, is important. Mm -hmm. So you identified lots of things that are in the transparency dashboard, access to a library and access to arts, um, special ed, that you, so we do want to report on that. Um, I think within the A to F system, weighting is on the table. This is the lowest weight to academic factors based on test scores we've ever proposed in an accountability system. It is, is lower 90, than now. 90 percent, right? No, yeah, it is um, growth and 70, 35 it's, and 35. It's, it's, it's actually, it, if, a, if a school then? has, it's, this gets a little bit confusing. If a school has all of the components, it's actually 29 percent for proficiency and 29 percent for growth. And then 15, I think, for grad rate, 10 for additional indicators, um, 14 for English learner progress, and then participation. Right now, our top to bottom is 50-50. Um, uh, AYP was entirely yeah. um, mm -hmm. tests with grad rate and, and, and a, a hard fail if you missed any box. So this is a, <laughs> yeah. it is a much lower weighting and then you run into really should we not be focusing on academic outcomes of students? There's that, I don't hear anybody at the table voicing that side of the argument but it is certainly one I hear often when I you know, I always try to think which crowd I'm presenting to, the one that's going to be like, yay, lower academics, or like, boo, lower academics. Um, there are some who are still telling us we ought to testing yeah. and academics are the same thing. Right. I know, but we don't have another good measure for academics outside of standardized testing. So we don't. We don't. Classes do. They Teachers do. do. So for a statewide accountability system, yeah. you know, would clear, we... be clear, we don't have to do any weighting. We don't um, have to do, we, because there's such wrestling with weighting, I th we don't have to do any. If we didn't sum to a final label, you wouldn't have to wait. Right. But again. Again, I, you know, this board knows I made a commitment to deliver that and I will be delivering that. As an option. Uh, yes. Okay. Is, I just, can I ask yes. a question? Sorry. <laughs> um, part of it's, because I actually appreciate having the standardized assessment to kind of look at whether or not 
the formative assessments I'm using in the classroom are actually aligned with what the expectations are in the state. I think part of where the breakdown really is is how the scores are used, not necessarily, or what is the purpose of them? Because exactly. my understanding is, because I've been able to um, attend the Michigan Assessment Consortium and um, in defining with those literacy standards with the difference between the summative, interim, and formative assessments and their, the, the purposes of each, those lines get really blurry and, um, and then that's when we kind of start to have those breakdowns. Um, and for teachers, oftentimes the focus then becomes on those standardized tests because they want, because it's like you spoke to earlier, a system of compliance. We want to be compliant, we want to, to, to reach whatever it is they're saying we need to achieve and because that's how we're being held accountable, that's what is focused on which actually undermines achievement. Mm -hmm. um, so where you were speaking to earlier, a focus on formative assessment, how to be able to in real time know where my students are and make adjustments in the moment to support learners is really what drives mm -hmm. achievement. Mm -hmm. So is there just some thinking around maybe the use of them? Because otherwise, how do we know whether or not like the, the, yeah. the bench, the interim assessments that I have um, align right. to what the state expectation is because are oftentimes kids who get all A's yeah. um, but are not proficient right. on M step. Well, there's clearly a discrepancy there so that I'm just, I'm, we wrestled a ton in the space of the, the innovative assessment team that worked on the problem solving assessment and the teamwork with, okay, we take it, you take it. Do you score it and put it in A to F? Because that some, in some ways ruins what it's meant for. So if we were to take formative assessment data and dump it into A to F, it would probably ruin what formative assessment is meant to do. Because now it's not about right. your teaching practice, now it's not integrated, it's about standardized and it's about did you get to the level we wanted and we have to then use certain practices and protocols to make sure it's even across all classrooms. And all of a sudden, this tool that is so powerful isn't useful anymore in the way that it is now. And you are absolutely right about the purpose of a summative assessment system, which is what's in the accountability now. We're trying to put more benchmark data in there. But the purpose is to certify learning and understand our progress against a set of standards. That is its purpose. That's what it's made to do and that's what we need to have it do. That's how we know as a state, are we moving toward becoming a top 10 state? It's that objective measure. It is not the powerful driver of instruction. Not because it's bad, but because it's not meant to be. <laughs> it was not developed for that. So I think we're trying to, with this vision, is say summative assessment has a place and we need to certify learning and we need to understand where we are as a state. We need to be honest about that. We also need to understand that summative assessment is not the be all and end all. It's not the only thing and we need more growth data, more from benchmark, and we also need people doing all these practices that won't directly impact that summative score, but if a teacher is doing really good formative assessment practices with good core instruction, there's the test scores of their students will go up. But what, what um, perverse incentives do we have in the system to worry about the test score and not worry about all the good practices? <laughs> and I think if we all had crystal balls to look back at the last 15, 20 years of testing and high stakes accountability and things and the ways we've used those tools in ways they weren't meant to be used, you know, we can see, but it doesn't mean that a summative test is evil or bad or not right. necessary for us to understand how we're working as a state. It's just not the only thing and it, there needs to be a, a wider range. But again, I would say we don't put formative assessment data in A to F or else right. then it, right. it dies. It's, it's so this gets to your point, Cassandra, what is the measure of academics that's better than a standardized test to put in there? I don't have a good answer for that. I think that's a good question for us to ask as a state. You've been trying to talk, I'm sorry. No, I just actually- I had Dr. Z and then Eileen. Oh, sorry. I apologize. Dr. Z? Um, yeah, there's a saying that it's a bad carpenter who blames his tools. And I think we have sometimes blamed the, the assessments. Um, I, I am minded of the story of the college president who uh, brand new elected, he was gonna you know, improve the football score, the, the football season. He walks into the, the room and he sees all the football players skipping rope. And he said, what are you guys skipping rope for? You guys would be practicing football. Get out on the field. Well, obviously he knew nothing at all about football because skipping rope helps develop your cardio so that you can sustain that. I have observed in the last 10 years, unfortunately, a number of school districts that have eliminated music, art, 
other extracurricular enriching activities that builds vocabulary and gives you a feeling for math so that they can concentrate on drill and kill and, and other ineffective mm -hmm. uh, methods. And on the, uh, on the other hand, I've seen several districts, Crawford, Osable, Armada, in Michigan where the superintendents knew what they were doing and they brought in these kinds of programs and they've gone from the, the bottom uh, uh, quintile to the top quintile in, in about four years. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's that knowledge that we need to promulgate rather than tinkering with the tools, uh, the measurement tools. All right, Eileen, please. So I was just trying to tease exactly that out of you because um, obviously uh, if the state wants to, um, if the state becomes involved in formative assessment, then because it's tax dollars meant to uh, figure out whether schools are moving the agenda, you know, the, the, the work for children ahead, then it needs to be completely aligned to the state standards. Correct. Um, Correct. I, and I think that also uh, there's benefit to local districts doing it, but they, there's no really good product on the market that helps them get there. Uh, and the ones that might be um, uh, are probably out of reach financially. So I don't know how to solve that, but it is true that if you don't have teachers who are trained in embedded assessment and you don't have a vision that aligns or pays for from the state level assessment, formative assessment that aligns with the summative, then uh, there has to be a lot of creativity, which is the problem that I was describing before. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I continue to think about in the moment, it's always, a, it's about um, I'm constantly collecting data and making successive approximations. It's the science of teaching, but it's understanding the practice that really gets the results. So it's teacher learning and being supported as a learner that really is what changes what we want to have happen. So maybe that's something to consider is what type of teacher <coughs> learning support mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. focus collaborative inquiry because you've talked about that too. What are the needs if we yeah. use the data to look at where the needs are and then what kind of inquiry process are we taking teachers through to uncover what we need to learn more about and are we implementing with fidelity and are we collecting data around the fidelity of implementation because that's what was talked about earlier from Norma Jean it's not what's being implemented but how it's being implemented and that's is there yes. some way to every local school district has their own teacher learning support system in, in essence, speak up? Yeah, yeah. 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 sorry, every local school district has their own teacher yeah. learning support system. In essence, um, ISDs provide a lot of standardized professional learning. The department has a few areas where we provide targeted professional learning. One of our goals that we're working on through the 10 and 10 and through our reorganization is to be stronger in the professional learning space for the profession. So I would love, this is my goal, that we could say every Michigan teacher knows X about formative assessment because we have built and delivered something and worked with them to make sure they know it. And then work with our ISD partners and other partners to do some what you're saying is the implementation. Are you actually doing it? Do you know what it means? It's one thing to take a class in formative mm -hmm. assessment. It's another to like have someone help you understand how it looks. So I think we are doing things. It is not in this presentation, but I appreciate so much this reminder that when I talk about assessment, I should not talk only about the summative because that is, while it's the most political and most contentious, it's not the most important. You're raising your hand. But, but, I, Tom? but I think that, uh, so we're suggesting to have informative summit uh, tests as well, assessments mm -hmm. within ESSA. Mm -hmm. And a, a district can do their own formative assessments, right? I mean, they can, they can gauge how they, they could choose any number of formative yes. assessments. But I remember during the Common Core debate when we, you know, the, the superintendent and those supporting it said, well, districts don't have to do this. They don't have to do Common Core. If we were going to make it more, you know, the, some of them just do what's best for the kids, even though it's not necessarily Common Core, uh, and then they get by on the exam the state exam and they just I guess parents know that the state exam the kids are getting the good you know so I mean I guess making it even more assessments and more uh, from the state just is is not allowing that local control that we so dearly love let me clarify that we are not in ESSA proposing one system of formative assessments um, there isn't actually a product for formative assessment. Formative assessment is a practice a set of practices it's not a buy it and do it we're we're, I am talking about when we think about the parts of our assessment vision that can be implemented through ESSA, it's really the summative and some of the benchmark work, but the 
in our 10 and 10 practices, the driver that formative assessment is, we need to be working to make sure that districts, schools, and really teachers have access to that set of practices, which are different based on your classroom, your context, the curriculum you're using locally. Um, exactly how you implement them will look different, but the, the, um, the accumulation of evidence that you're talking about is a practice that we, it's a best practice for teaching. So S is not requiring us to do this um, at all. It, it's just, if we only did what was required in ESSA, we would lose some power in the system. So we want to make sure we think about it overall. I'm not sure the system should be powerful. Okay. All right, Vanessa, please yes, continue. I'd like I more know. flexibility <laughs> at the local level. Um, statewide system of support. This is a piece of the ESSA plan that is fully federally driven. So both these labels and the funding stream. Um, so these are, there's three labels that we have to identify for federal purposes. Comprehensive support schools, which are bottom 5% schools, targeted support schools, schools in which any subgroup of students is underperforming, and additional targeted support schools. Um, we at this point haven't talked much about identification method, exit criteria, how often we name those schools. We propose that you do it less often. Um, that runs afoul of our 1280C law, which as somebody mentioned already is now there's interest in that. So, you know. Um, so basically, uh, what the superintendent has asked us to do is keep working to, pro to put forward proposals for how we identify these schools for federal purposes, how we identify them, how we exit them, knowing that this part of the law, th there's been clear signals, CCSSO really thinks this part of the law will get pulled back, but we want to be in a position where we have some plans that have been developed in place and we can change those plans, or if the federal law here goes away, then we won't name these types of schools, or we'll think about what Michigan wants to do. But we're trying to keep moving forward. This has not received a lot of discussion because we have focused a lot on A to F, so this needs to, this is an area of discussion. And then once these schools are named, there is a federal funding stream used to serve those schools, just those schools. So it's, it's um, I'm gonna get the letter wrong, 1003G, I think. Somebody's cringing somewhere in the department because I got it wrong right now. Um, <laughs> the funds can only be used to serve those schools. So we're looking at a blended system of grants to ISDs with LEA sign off on the plans for support and then a statewide technical assistance grant. Um, we need to just continue talking about how we best deploy the funds and then how do we ensure that the service plans reflect both the <coughs> needs of the districts and maximize what ISDs are bringing. So um, that's remaining. Oops. The next two will go quickly, um, I think. <laughs> we, are, we are offered some opportunity in ESSA to integrate early childhood more firmly into the K-12 system. ESSA has, um, there have been a lot of opportunities for linkages over the years, but we have not been intentional about it. Most states haven't. And some of the laws changed, so there's even more. So a couple things we're proposing that we need to spend more time talking about because we just, again, it's, it's the next thing queued up to talk about but integrating some of the quality standards and great start to quality um, into these different quality standards in early childhood into requirements for Title I funded preschool programs, so link those two concepts. <laughs> um, helping districts blend their title funding with other early childhood funding and use it for a variety of things. We just listed a couple there. Uh, focusing on that adoption of age appropriate evidence-based practices for use in pre-K through third grade classrooms. Um, What's the earliest that we'll be te uh, testing children? I Currently, are, according are, to state, do, do kids have to be uh, kindergarten ready? Currently, according to state Say, law, I asked that tongue in cheek, but I think actually that the answer is yes. But um, currently, can according kids can kids fail a test at kindergarten? Currently, according to state law, starting I think next year, we need to provide assessments, or kids need to be assessed in kindergarten, first and second. We are currently providing assessments um, in first and second. Um, kindergarten was not required the new there's three laws that govern the assessment space k12 and when you intersect them it it does have requirement for kindergarten testing not readiness testing and we've worked a lot Susan has worked a lot to get us talking less about readiness and kindergarten entry observation protocols and how we understand readiness in a diverse way and that it's not a yes you're ready or no you're not but more about equipping educators with information about what the students are coming in with across a variety of domains um, but state law does require testing in this space this is something the superintendent has shared thoughts about um, but we do have state law in the books for that so but I do want to say when we're looking at the kindergarten first and second grade assessments they look different it's mm -hmm. more of a game like assessment yep. it's not what you would think about a traditional right. assessment. 
And currently districts also have flexibility to use their own types right. of assessments in one and two. The state provides something. We have about 10 to 14% of districts using ours, but the rest are using something. So they might be using a different product or their own tool. Is, um, that, is that reported up to the state? When they take ours, it is. But it's not, we don't it's use it. Handy. We right. don't use it in accountability. Um, we are reporting back to the schools, and I think at some point, with the th this is part of the implementation of the third grade reading law that we need to look at um, how we, what we do about that with that data. But right now, they're taking it in accordance with state law and should be using it locally. Yes. So when speaking about unintended consequences, obviously the third grade reading bill drives a whole different discussion about getting kids ready so that they can function well in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And I'm very anxious that that not drive us to an academic assessment going into kindergarten, but rather a developmental uh, right. uh, preparedness assessment. And Susan's nodding her head. I mean, okay. uh, but it's, um, uh, I don't know whether this is a moment to address that or whether we need to talk about it later on, because I know there's a pilot right. that's different from an academic as yep. a developmental one. I think what we learned, um, sorry, I <laughs> when, what we learned with the, the department pilot of the kindergarten entry assessment was that um, we needed to, as a state, have a much better understanding of what readiness looks like across many domains. It is not merely academic readiness. And there's a, the, the next, so we did not expand the KEA out to a statewide implementation. So it's one time when a pilot worked the way it was supposed to, we tried it in a small scale and said, no, this does not support our key goals. The new pilot that three districts are doing, they got some funding. Um, you're right, it's more of a multi-domain. And then we have a stakeholder group working on this kindergarten entry observation status concept that there are, and I, Susan was nodding very much, she has been a big advocate for don't reduce kindergarten readiness to academics. That is far too narrow of a, of a view of what it means to be ready for kindergarten. But we are right there and the department's taking positions on that. I'm sorry, sorry. I love I the just want to say that The reason that I'm so anxious about this is that all of the readiness skills that a child needs to participate in society have to be taught start early on because by the time they get into school, um, you know, if you've missed Duck, Duck, Goose, then you may not know how to take your turn. And I can't, um, uh, I can't emphasize enough that we will shortchange K-12 if we uh, have more uh, mm -hmm. pre-K that doesn't fit um, uh, the, 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 what children should be going through in birth to five. All right, Michelle, please, and then Nikki. Yeah, just a couple of things. One, um, uh, just an observation. Um, at, uh, as a foster parent and um, you know, we look at the, these assessments and, and why I sometimes think that, I, I, I believe we have to have an assessment. I think it should be st statistically valid and um, uh, not an overemphasis on the tests that um, might skew things. Um, for instance, a um, little boy came to me um, years ago, just finished kindergarten, couldn't identify a letter from the alphabet, couldn't um, spell his name, um, he's still with me. He's now reading at a grade ahead. Um, he's in uh, uh, third grade and he's reading at fourth grade, almost fifth grade level. So, but but it, the difference was is that he's at the same school. We kept him in the same school. Um, is that he has um, his mother didn't because of her own issues wasn't able to send her kid to school. So somehow the school is going to be negatively affected because there, were, there wasn't the parental support to, um, to um, he wasn't there to learn. So, so for him to progress when he's in, you know, living in pretty significant poverty um, and without the necessary social supports, um, I, I have a real concern that the teachers and the schools that are working in the highest poverty areas because of issues like this, are automatically going to get these Fs, and um, you know, and, and treated uh, in a way that uh, further is going to get further to recruit teachers to come and work there and stay. So th that's some of the unintended consequences that I'm concerned about, and with the overemphasis that can happen. And, and I know it's a, it's uh, it's difficult to try to gauge things, but um, I I see it firsthand you know, being a parent in Detroit and seeing the teacher shortages. Let me um, just clarify that ESSA does not require any mm -hmm. testing in the younger grades. ESSA doesn't require, <coughs> so as far as, there are a lot of conversations with Susan leads us through a lot and we have focused, she, she mentioned in her, in her introduction, the P8 focus is a big focus that we're trying to deal with with the 10 and 10 and, and the right. reorg. Um, 
Essa itself doesn't, or like we have a bigger conversation to flesh out here. With Essa, it's more about we can use some title funding to support some key goals in early childhood and help the systems link better. So it's not early childhood, K-12, as if those things are separate to the point. So the uh, question was about, but I just want to be clear, Essa okay, does okay, not yeah. require anything actually in K-1-2 in terms right. of standards, I'm assessments, accountability, and we aren't proposing to roll anything up into the A to F from okay. these Although spaces. I am worried about a disproportionate effect in the lower income with this uh, retention bill in the third well, I grade. Think, I think the implementation of the retention bill is certainly something we need to spend a lot of time yeah, on and it's going to hit the poor communities like a, yeah. like a brick and it's not going to have a much of an right. effect on other communities and it's going to affect funding. So I, I, I just, um, in, in arguing when we look at what's being measured and how, you know, and a lot of it is, and I agree with uh, what was said that how it's being used, but I think just sometimes having those measures can create um, and having labels uh, without really having a, a nuanced and uh, fully, um, you know, considered <laughs> um, perspective about why those scores are the way they are and how to adjust because of it. So. Uh, so I guess I'm saying, and, and it's not just in the lower grades, you know, I've taken in kids that are uh, teenagers, one um, he, I adopted, he had a hearing impairment, no hearing aids, he was in special ed, he was flunking out, and then we got him hearing aids, and all of a sudden, and you know, put the fear of God, and God in him to make him go to school every day, and he, you know, his grade point went, you know, way up. And it was because of that, but the same school, he was in the same school, and it wasn't the teachers, and it wasn't the school that should have been punished. It, 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 it's much deeper than that. And so the, I see this as being um, not, uh, it needs to take more into consideration, and maybe it can't be done because of the federal laws, but I think that that has to be clearly recognized. So that's just one point I just wanted to make. The other thing is I don't hear, um, I hear about commingling funds and I'm concerned about uh, special ed funds and uh, because they're underfunded as it is. Mm -hmm. And um, some schools, I think because of all of this, there's a, there's a disincentive to um, provide special ed services. There's some incentive, it, some, it, it incentivizes uh, uh, in some ways putting kids in center-based programs because of the grades and because of the money. Um, it, it's sort of a relief. So, um, and if so, there's, if there's going to be commingling, commingling of funds, how does um, well, what's going to happen to the special ed funds? And in developing these criteria, um, has there been discussion about dealing with these unintended circumstances affecting special ed students? Um, so, when we talk about blending and braiding funding streams, the intent isn't to it actually is about title having more flexibility than it had in the past. So being able to send your title one, two, three, four, more flexibly on areas of identified need. Um, I think with the partnership model, and in particular in the partnership districts, we want to work if they, this is part of the comprehensive needs assessment, are you providing the special ed services you need to be? Is your special ed system working the way you need it to? Do you have a good multi-tiered system of support in place so that you're not over-identifying or under-identifying? Are you appropriately identifying? Um, so I don't think the funding there, I don't think there's like a risk of stealing from the special ed funds to do something. I mean, that's not even, that's not an allowable use of funds. It's more about, it's not like there's special ed funds over here to serve special ed kids and that those kids aren't also potentially economically disadvantaged or right. et cetera, et cetera. Like special ed kids are general ed kids first. So how do we have a, an, a, an approach where we maximize the special ed funds after you've provided the things you need to provide with the general ed funds? Um, and really just integrating practice, best practices. So, um, and so again, ESSA doesn't get into, ESSA is not IDEA. So it's about coordination between the plans, but the, the plan, this plan itself doesn't require us to say anything actually about how we use IDEA or special ed funds. But it, it, it all comes back to that comprehensive needs assessment and the trying to, the well-rounded education for every child. Yeah, but the special ed kids and the, the test scores having that count is 70 percent of the assessment, um, it creates a disincentive to even have those kids in your school because the money isn't coming in. So, the, so is there any discussion about incentivizing um, ways to have schools uh, want to take those kids in, and they're not fully funded? So there's a, even a you know there, so there, there's these issues with test scores, but there's also issues that there's going to be a drain on the finances. Um, 
and uh, you know we've seen that there's certain schools that don't take in kids with special special ed kids and, and then they, they end up in the traditional publics um, being overrepresented and being a financial structural um, okay. concern so I, I was just wondering what we can look at some more incentives or um, ways to to address that okay thank you building off of your uh, uh, Nikki please oh, it's Nikki's turn sorry I just wanted to sort of build off of a couple things that you said I sort of feel like you're talking about the gap that exists when we create that spectrum and then how can we address that but my question was you know and I, I admire that you're here doing this because we've all just been kind of like going after you I almost feel like we could go through the whole thing again just to make sure I understand what you're saying but um, so a lot of questions I guess um, just to zero in on something that Michigan needs to really have an impact on it in being top 10 and 10 and, in, and even through ESSA reading literacy um, which would have an impact on everything that we're talking about. Do we have a committee here that does reading literacy that yep. can, okay, so on the State Board of Education? Not on the State Board, but we have a couple things. We have the departmental people who are working on it, and there's also a Governor's Commission working on it. Okay, so maybe there's a way that we could partner mm -hmm. um, with you in that capacity mm -hmm. to make sure that that's a, a real focus. No question. Yes. Okay, we are extremely uh, behind. I'm going to call on Tom in a minute. So, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, I, I know we're behind, but uh, and I guess I, I'll ask this question. If we, I, I want to get the weight of what we're doing because I think uh, it should. If it needs to spill into after lunch, that's fine. Because <laughs> if, let's just say, if the feds reject our plan, and you know, do they not write? It? I mean, and ultimately, we do all the appeals and whatever's necessary, and they say no, and we say too bad. <laughs> We're going to do it anyway. Uh, how much money are we talking about is at stake that they would not cut a check to us? Well, there, even before that, there is a lot of things in ESSA about the um, limiting the authority of the U.S. De Secretary of Education to reject a plan. Not only that, we're hearing clear signals that USAID is not going to reject plans. And our history would say that's not what happens. There is potential negotiation. So I think it's, I don't anticipate us having a situation where we can't find a way forward that, um, preserves our federal funding and lets us do what Michigan wants. Well, but, but we're I talking mean, about it, significant amount billion? of money. Is it a billion a year? Is uh, it 10%? Overall, overall take of federal money is this $2, Two billion in this, and that would be at stake if for some reason they said we... If they chose to go that way. Yeah, they want, that's their hammer, is $2 billion. My second question is to the superintendent, uh, back in November, I, at the one hour and 13 minute mark, you had said to John Austin, you promised him to bring it back here for approval by the board. So I just want to make sure you're still, you, you won't move forward unless there's five, at least five votes. Is that right? Uh, <laughs> I, it is not my intent to move forward without board support. Not my intent to do that, yes. Now, I am going to do some things that the board may not like. I am going to have a report card because I have made that commitment and the board was aware of that commitment. So there's some things that you may not like, but I have to do it and I'm going to do it because of previous promises. Now, what the legislature does with it, that's up, you know, up to them. But there will be some things you won't like that well, I have to do. Report card, you don't. Why do you have to do that? The, you mean the, uh, going to an A or a B? Yes. Why I do you have to do that? Because I promised during the negotiations in the Detroit legislation with the governor and the legislature they were going to pass a report card as part of that. And I said, time out, give me a year uh, to go through a process to seek input and then let me deliver a report card. So it's my credibility uh, to say that I would deliver that. Now, that doesn't mean they have to implement it. It doesn't mean the legislature or governor have to implement it. Uh, but I have to deliver one. And so uh, that was a promise I made. The board was aware. I made that promise, and I do live up to my promises. I, I thought that promise was to the legislature. I didn't think. Yeah, the governor and the legislature. All of us that disagreed, which I think there's a lot of disagreement in going up to an A uh, for a school and, and labeling a school, you're still going forward? I still will deliver probably two options, one that delivers up to a, a grade and one that doesn't. Is this what you're referring to? When you're yeah. But not necessarily that we'll work with right, you on it right yes it's similar. Yeah. <laughs> okay I mean and, and I have talked to stakeholders that have been in some of these stakeholder advisory committee meetings and they said that 
there was not really any back and forth. They came in, MD told them, this is what we're doing, and that was it. You know, there was no, so I mean, I, you know, and I'm, this is my first meeting, so certainly we can talk further, but I think there's a long way on this ESSA plan. It's extremely important. And, you know, you had mentioned we could do three hours on the assessment. I think we ought to do three hours in the assessment. We could do it next week or, I mean, you know, I, I, and whatever it takes, because this is a, a big deal. It's going to constrain, a, you know, I, we talk about MTS, MTSS. I think that's how, that's how we teach. I mean, not only are we saying what we teach, it's, I mean, a lot of it is these multi-layers, and this is what you're going to do, and then you're going to go to here. And, you know, I, before we put all these into a $2 billion dollar, price tag that you know we, we have to do I think we really need to make sure there's as much flexibility for local control and that we really wrestle That's, with some of these issues yeah the whole design of everything we're doing is none of this other than when at once we come up with an assessment vision mm -hmm. all the other things that we're doing is still local control mm -hmm. the whole design of when we tell a district that they their test scores say or other indicators say they're failing it's going to be up to the local district what they do to turn it around. Well, but I think what we say is failing. They may not be failing. We're, who are we to say exactly what, you know, that there's one key, that's it. It's either this or else you're, well, who are we to say that for sure? I mean, that, that's, that's a lot of uh, imposition on the, the locals. And I think we could trust them uh, a lot more to do what's right. And on the testing on special ed, ESSA says that you can only do 1% of an alternative test which is about 10% of special ed. Well, that's outrageous. Well, we have to just say, we're me, not doing that. Let me we're clarify gonna, We're going to allow... 80% uh, of our students with disabilities take the standard <laughs> assessment with accommodations. The remaining 20% take the alternate assessment, which is the my access. Well, that 80% And this has been our law. This has been a law, the 1% and the 2% exception for years. And we have never hit our state cap and all districts are appropriately placing kids into the my access assessment or appropriately having them take the main assessment with accommodations. Most students with disabilities don't need the alternate assessment because they're not being ta taught alternate content standards. So this is actually not a real problem for Michigan. It's 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 working well and Michigan has a long tradition of inclusion of special ed students and working toward the most inclusive and at least restrictive environment most inclusive and services that don't isolate students and to your point Michelle we want to disincentivize this concept of here's a kid with special ed stick them in a center and do something different it's about integrating students into the environment so on that out. point and then I did want to return if I could to the stakeholder groups um, we did with something like the accountability group we said build an A to F system. We didn't say what system do you want to build. Uh, with the accountability vision committee that superintendent convened before ESSA, we did say what do you want, what's important. Um, with the assessment group, same thing. We said here's the superintendent's assessment vision. Think about how do we move toward it. So in some groups, we did start somewhere. Others, we said here's the universe of possibilities. So there is some truth, depending on who you talk to. Some of them were handed a charge that was a little bit more specific because it built off of promises or previous discussion. And then uh, dealing with opting no, out. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yep, we'll pay. Uh, two things. I, I really think that in order for us to keep the conversation going and, and opportunities for all board members, we have to go through the superintendent. He is conducting the meeting. And if our name is not called, I don't think we should talk. Another thing is that uh, we in this board, I for one, and I don't want to tell you my personal business, but I have a medical condition, and I have to go eat at 12. So no, we cannot spill into lunch because there's other variables that we as board members are consistent. Okay. I just meant after lunch. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, so it is five minutes to 12. So can you wrap up in the yes. next five minutes, please? Um, we will align and coordinate B12 programs with early childhood, um, and we will continue to work through what's on the transparency dashboard and then the emerging ideas in, in the educator workforce. So um, again, I flagged we had approval on the or consensus around those are important topics. The implementation has pieces that there are still, we wanna just continue. Implementation won't be done when we submit the plan. Implementation is ongoing and the devil's always in the details. So we need to continue talking and having open dialogue and we intend to do that. Um, so, yes, that is my wrap-up. All right, Eileen, please. <laughs> uh, because you're so busy going forward, moving sideways, and wrapping up all at once, uh, I only want to point out that Senator Lamar Alexander has said that the current rules and regulations do not fit the essence of yes. the ESSA law. And, of course, there is a new administration in Washington that may be doing things uh, with that USDOE, uh, forwarding 
uh, responsibility down to the states, accountability. So I hear you've got more work ahead than I think you were planning on in October. And I don't think it's so awful if we take time to make sure that all of those possibilities are juggled. I recognize the strength of the, of the process that you've been going through. I, like Tom, have heard some rumblings that people felt they weren't listened to. And no matter what, you, you've already said you want to listen to us, that there are things that, that you can't get around. So I don't think that uh, with the new final deadline of September 1st, rushing into this in the next month or two was exactly what uh, the board would envision being to have happen, just because of the constraints of the information flow for two new board members. I realize that, but we also have to be fair to school districts. If they're going to be held accountable in 2017-18 for a system, we can't design it in June or in August and then tell them what they're going to be accountable for. May I ask then state. why they changed the deadline to September 1st and I'm hearing that other, uh, states, yeah. other states don't plan to submit till then? Uh, I don't know, but the, the, <coughs> it does require us to hold the, our Michigan law and the federal law requires us for 17-18. The funding, all the funding changes in 17-18, so it's a whole new system. And then, um, <laughs> you know, something like the new accountability system, if we, I don't know what we would do with 1718 if we didn't have a, a system in place. I mean, well, I do. So I, I know what will right. happen. The legislature will design one, and we won't like it. <laughs> <laughs> or we might. I, <laughs> I don't think so. All right, we are adjourned for lunch.